We are starting the lecture for to continue further from what we left off the last class. We didn't do our uh, sir, uh, last Saturday class. I was not doing good and I couldn't take the class. <coughs> so we continue from here. Or you now, sir. Thank you very much. <coughs> so it says that a couple is defined as two equal parallel and opposite forces uh, who are going to simultaneously work on an object. These are called a, a, a couple. Uh, grammatically, the word couple and moment, they are exactly the same thing, but uh, the way with the vocabulary or uh, English vocabulary works is that we use talk, the word talk for, more for couple and the word moment more, uh, more commonly with force. So talk of a couple and moment of a force are more common phrases, but if you replace those two, uh, two words, it would be if you is perfectly correct. <clears throat> How can you calculate the uh, talk, uh, talk of a couple? So here, here has uh, have a look. Uh, the torque of a couple will always be equals to one of these forces multiplied by the perpendicular distance between the two forces. Have a look. The torque of a couple is always going to be one of these forces. Do you have two forces over here, F and F? Let me take this out. Okay. So two forces over here. One is working vertically upwards F, and one is working vertically downwards F. This kid has tried to draw equal length, almost nearly equal length, to represent the forces have equal magnitude, and they are offset from each other, which means they are not working in the same line. They are opposite direction. They are parallel to each other, both are vertical. So uh, they are producing a couple together. They are producing a couple onto this object. Now, this object could be could could be pivoted at any point. This object could might as well not be pivoted. This object might be uh, what might be uh, floating in the space. <clears throat> this it doesn't matter whether, whether this object is uh, is is pivoted or not, uh, because as long as we have a situation like this, we can always calculate the torque of the of that couple by multiplying one of these forces, not both of them, into the perpendicular distance between them. Now, there's a catch that you might wonder that we have two forces working, then why should we consider it to be uh, for it fit for uh, why, why should in the formula the torque of the couple should be expressed by f into d? The, the reason is that the way we have defined the idea of moment is that moment is moment of a force is the product of the force and the perpendicular distance of the force from the focal point. If whenever we'll multiply these two with these two vector one and <coughs> these two quantities, we will get the moment. So in this, in these five different boxes, we used uh, different different positions as our uh, considered the different different positions along this line as our pivot point. So, and what we're going to try to show you over here is that no matter which point you consider, you'd always get the same value. For example, uh, for the first uh, first part, at a moment of f equals to zero. What did, what I will remain? If you consider this a point as our uh, pivot point, well, the thing is. Whenever you are calculating moment for an object, as long as you do not do calculation mistake, you can consider any point around the object, inside the object, outside the object as your virtual pivot point. Virtual pivot point means that you can assume that this object will rotate about that point. If the question does not specify, more commonly applicable for cases, if the question does not specify what is your pivot point, or if the question does not specify about which point are you supposed to take the uh, moments from which means the uh, what should be the uh, what should be the point from where all the forces perpendicular distances should be measured if the question doesn't specify you have the you will always have the privilege to choose the point about which you want to calculate the moment and there is a smart way to choose a point so that you can have you will always have to do fewer number of calculations and whatever which i'm going to cover uh, in, in a while but one of the key information is that if we consider if you try to calculate the moment about a point uh, through which the force goes through, for example, if you have, have a look at this equation, here AB is the name of the rod, and this dotted line shows the extent, uh, axis line of the, of the AB rod. And let's say this was a bit extended outwards up to here, up to here. I'm sorry, up to a random length Y up over here. And we are going to try to calculate the moment for different, different points. So whenever we are trying to calculate the moment at A, the moment of force F equals to zero, because if you consider this point as your pivot point, you are this, this downward force F is working exactly through that point or directly away from the point. 
which means with respect to point A, the perpendicular distance of force F is practically zero. So the moment of this force equals to force into zero. So if you have to read this thing, you have to be careful to read this thing. This this whole thing is one thing. I mean, this is not meaning F equals to zero. Just don't, don't look over here. Read this whole thing. At A, moment of F equals to zero, which means this force downwards is not producing any moment at point A. Therefore, moment at, uh, so, the the this uh, the way this okay, I mean I actually I think I used a downwards and upwards symbol in my class I believe, but this kid actually prefer to write about location which perfectly works. So this force doesn't produce any moment. So if you calculate the moment using this force, with respect to the point A for this rectangular box, uh, for, uh, this is the value of the force F, and the total distance from A to B is D. So the moment produced by the force available at B point is F D. So this is your position over here. That's one way. So you can see that the total moment produced by the combination of this uh, of these two forces or the couple is F into D. We do not have two over here. Now let's say if we don't want to consider that, let's say if we consider exactly the midpoint of the rod and go ahead and try to calculate the moment where we have to do the calculation for both of them. We can also do that. For pivot at the center of the rod, <coughs> for pivot at the center of the rod, total moment produced would be the sum of the two moments because if you have a look. If you consider your pivot over here, so assume that this object is pivoted over here, which means this object can rotate about this point. You have to assume that. So if we have a downward force over here, this end is gonna try to go down, this end is gonna try to go up. So this, the tendency of this entire object's motion for this force should be anti-clockwise. For this force, force it should be also anti-clockwise. Now, because both the objects are gonna try to rotate anti-clockwise, so you, we are going to sum up those two moments. That's what we're doing over here. So from this point, uh, for the midpoint, uh, for the moment produced by this vertical force would be F into D2 because we define this to be center of the rod, so there is equal length on both sides. So this is the uh, anti clockwise moment produced by this force, and this is the anti clockwise moment produced by that force. So I can, I might as well draw this for uh, for the D point. I mean, let's say this is the anti clockwise moment for this point, and this is the anti clockwise moment for this point. So we have uh, two anti clockwise moments, we simply added them up FD by 2 plus FD by 2, you still get FD. That's the important bit. Then, if we start, if we do the opposite thing, I mean, uh, we, if we try to calculate, why do we want to buy a marker? So, if we try to if we if we try to take the moment about point B, in that case, the moment of F equals to zero. One of the things A force the moment of is zero for this for this for this box, for the red box, the moment for this one will become zero. And in that case, the moment of F at A would become F in D. So you are still gonna have the same value as this one. This much anti-clockwise, and this will also give you this much anti-clockwise. You're not getting any different values, irrespective of your choice of your pivot point. That's the that's the highlight of this whole whole page. Then, if we try to take the moment from a random point that is outside the rod, let's say I want to move, I want to measure the moment of these two forces from here. Now, there comes a bit of an important bit, what I need to understand. If you consider this as a, as, a, as a pivot point, have a look at these two forces. About this point, if you assume that this object is gonna rotate about this point, which means this object is gonna go down like that. I mean, uh, I cannot show this. I mean, if you consider this is the center of the rotation of this object, so this object can is gonna rotate like that. So, you should be seeing that with respect to this point, <clears throat> this force, this this vertical force, uh, let me choose a different color, blue maybe. Yeah, this vertical force, uh, this is gonna produce a clockwise moment, and this is gonna produce an anti-clockwise moment, because with respect to this pivot point, this force is downwards, this force is upwards, so they are not essentially producing moment in the same direction. The force working at location A is producing an clockwise moment, this one is producing an anti-clockwise moment. And just by looking at this figure, we can very easily understand between these two moments, this moment is gonna be far too bigger compared to this moment. Because the two forces are exactly equal, but with respect to perpendicular distance, A point is only, I mean this point, this end A, A point is only Y distance apart, whereas the B point is Y plus D. That's a much larger distance apart. So when we will be the product of force into perpendicular distance, F into Y would be definitely smaller compared to F into Y plus D. So here, 
to for the sake of understanding, uh, the I actually won in sequence. So I literally write f y minus f into y plus d. Here minus the main reason that you the core reason for the minus is that uh, I wanted to highlight that this in this case the moment produced by these two forces would not be working in the same direction because we have shifted that pivot point outside our object. So one of the forces should be producing clockwise moment, the other one should be producing anti-clockwise moment. Hence, to make them differentiate, to be able to do differentiate them, I have given a minus sign. But ultimately, I was getting a minus sign vector. So have a look. In this case, this was represented as the positive moment. This one is represented as the negative moment. If you wonder what is positive and negative moment, well, moment is a vector quantity. Moment can have only two possible directions. It can be clockwise or anti-clockwise. So if you consider one of the directions to be positive, you can you have to consider the opposite direction to be anti uh, uh, negative. So here we are considering this force as was positive moment. So for this scenario, uh, the clockwise direction was considered positive and the anti-clockwise moment was considered negative. So I'll, after doing the calculation, the final value that you are left with is minus FD, which basically means the total moment or total moment produced by this torque. Sorry, by this couple or the torque that will be produced by this couple is still going to be f into d anti-clockwise you, you will see that you are getting the exactly same expression you're not giving anything different last point, last option if you choose any random point inside the object let's say we are choosing a random point inside the object this is for the last box if you choose a random point inside the inside the object which is x distance away from point location a and we try to calculate the moment. So we're talking about this point over here. Let's say I'm going to use green. So we're talking about this point over here. Or I'm going to use red. Okay. We try to talk about this, this point over here. So if you try to, I mean, this is a random point. Let's, uh, let's assume. If you try to, if you try to calculate the moment uh, or the uh, uh, of about this point on these two sides, we can also go ahead and further to do these two calculation. Uh, in this case, uh, the moment. Uh, produced by force f is gonna be f into x this is anti-clockwise so forget about the blue arrows i'm gonna use red arrows for for these moments so we're doing it for this point this will be anti-clockwise moment this will be anti-clockwise moment so we can add them together that's what we're doing so moment produced by this force will be f into x this is the perpendicular distance moment produced by the, this vertically upward force working at B location should be f into d minus x. If you want a d minus x cosine theta slope, uh, this is this is the length that we had defined to be x, and the entire length of the bar was considered to be d. So this much distance, I mean, from this point up to this point, this much should be the total length minus this much. <laughs> that way you get this one. That's why it is becoming d minus x. So if we now do the whole calculation, f into x plus f into d minus x, all together we can get fd, and that's also the similar thing. question uh, so preferably question publicly I really appreciate this so that everyone else can uh, get some context of what I'm about to say. Uh, so the whole point of this whole discussion is that if we have a couple working on an object, irrespective of our choice of pivot point. The total torque produced by the, that couple would always be the would always be one of the forces of the couple multiplied by the perpendicular distance between those two forces, and this is how the calculations are gonna always work out. All right. Uh, so the other question was so why rod uh, why uh, rod why is marked outside the rod. Uh, is it possible the overall can rotate? Well, to be honest, the rotate, I mean, pivot point means the rotational center or orbiting center of the object. That point doesn't have to be inside the, ob inside the object. Try to think about it. Uh, let's say in a merry-go-round of a fun ride in a, in a, in a, in a, in a amusement park, you're sitting on a chair and the wheel is continuously going around. You're not essentially, or or you are not necessarily rotating on your own axis. You are not spinning, but you are orbiting the center of the merry-go-round ride. That is not rotation, but because but you are not essentially going anywhere. Think about this. You are basically stuck in the same place, going around in circles. So you have circular motion, and in that case, the center of your pivot for rotation is the center of that ride. So it's possible that the an object uh, for a uh, pivot point could be located outside the object. It doesn't have to be within the object. 
Fala, é muito igual Okay, so you don't have to ask me about this. Jessie, say hello. Sir, for the green box, sir, could you please repeat minus the camera? Oh, minus the, minus the can actually, when it differential cause you know the house, it is a short term minus you do it, it's a positive way to put it. Both the same. We assumed the clockwise moment produced as positive moment. So we had to give a minus sign for the anti-clockwise moment. Have a look at the figure and try to understand. If you consider this point as a pivot point. Sir, what the good sir? Sorry? Pivot the good sir. Pivot the good sir. For pivot outside the rod, we are assuming the pivot is located here. F into Y gives you the clockwise moment in this direction. And F into D plus Y plus D gives you the anti-clockwise moment uh, for, for this force over at this location. Now, because the two, these two moments are working in opposite direction, that's why we had to use different sign, opposite sign to, cal to calculate them together. Because we consider the clockwise moment as a positive moment, since there is a positive sign over here, we had to give a negative sign in front of it. This minus sign does not necessarily mean that the final moment would be in the same alignment as the negative considered moment on, on, of our calculation. Because this was, I mean, this, this moment, I mean, for this figure, this negative moment meant which moment? Clockwise moment or anti-clockwise moment? Anti-clockwise moment. Anti-clockwise moment. And the final answer has also become a negative, which means our final moment will also be anti-clockwise moment. That's the basic, the basic uh, meaning of this minus sign. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sure, no problem. Okay. Unkita has given us a question. Hold on just a second. Sorry, I was trying to suppress sneezing and then I sneezed. So, uh, yeah, Onkita is giving us a question is that, but for the moments of pivot position uh, is important. And for a couple, we can consider any point for pivot and it wouldn't matter. That's correct. That's absolutely, absolutely correct. For a single force, it is definitely very important for the, how much would be the moment be for the same value of force. I mean, the further your pocket, I mean, the bigger the distance from the pivot to your force for a single force that is you'll always get a bigger moment because moment is defined by force in the distance of the force from the pivot point so if you have the same force working at different position considered to a pivot point then you will always get a bigger bigger moment for bigger distances but for a couple that really does not matter because we have two forces together producing the turning effect so you can get always you can always get the same value as long as your calculation is not mistaken. That's the whole point of this discussion for the couple. So the initial to the echo pivot by the attacker man would say having the object move 
like this. Okay, let's say I keep it over here, take it over here. Can I take it over here? Can I ex ex extend the space? No, I don't think I can. <laughs> okay, better. <clears throat> the reason I came to paint three is to give you an idea that what what does it mean for us to have the pivot point outside this point over here? I mean, the pivot point doesn't have to be within the object. It can be located outside the object where the object might be rotating using another point of rotation. For example, the earth is going around the sun. The earth is going around the sun. So for this orbit, the center of orbit is located at the center of the sun not inside the earth itself earth is also or, or earth is also spinning on its own axis that's another motion and it is also at the same time orbiting around the sun so if you if you want to consider a pure point somewhere outside your object that is also very much possible that's the that's what i'm trying to mean so for example let's say if you consider this point I and mean this red dot as our pure point it is possible that our object which is right over here can have a rotation like that it can go around in orbit like that this is possible to have so the position of the object doesn't have to be hey, uh, the position of the pivot doesn't have to be inside the object it can be outside and in that case all that you have to do or all that you are expected to do is to do the calculation accordingly so you use the idea of force into perpendicular distance and depending on the duration of the moment you you you, you uh, add or subtract them accordingly so for this figure, whenever we consider the pivot point is located outside, the two moments produced by these two forces were not working in the same direction. One of the forces was producing clockwise movement, the other force was making anti-clockwise movements. That's why as vector quantities, we did not directly add these up. So we represent this one as a positive vector. I might as well try to give a positive sign over here for understanding. Since we have considered this moment as a positive moment, the other moment had to be considered as a negative moment. That's the idea. <laughs> Can you ask where the pivot lies outside the rod? Yes. Oh, come on. There is this kid, there is the horse, and if you and this kid is going to start rotating. About, a, about an imaginary point that is somewhere over here. There's the center of this whole ride. So he's, uh, this kid's uh, pivot center is not in, located inside the kid. It is outside. Please speak up. Uh, kids, you can speak up. You can ask me and respond. In the in the voice channel as well, which I think is a bit more faster for communication. Okay, beautiful. Thank you. What happened to this part of my YouTube? What?
ओके आशा की की क्या आशा तुम्हें कौन पार्ट बुझा नहीं बोलो स्पेसिफाई वॉइस चैनल इसको और प्रेफरेबली आई मीन लुकिंग एट द चैट गोइंग बैक एंड फॉर्थ बिकॉज़ द चैट विंडो हैज टू बी ओपन ओवर हियर व्हिच कॉलअप ये आई बुझते से एक्टर कमेंट नेगेटिव क्या में होए माने आपने माइनस एफ डी लेख से ना और बुझते से ना इटा और मेरी गो राउंडर पीबोर्ड पॉइंट तो मैं बुझी नहीं को मेरी गो राउंडर पीबोर्ड पॉइंट है कोई वो ये पूरा राइडर जिस पॉसिबल सेंटर टास से शेज़ जगह पे हैं तो सर वो तो आउटसाइड द रोड क्या में हुए लो आउटसाइड द पर्सन ओ Kid is orbiting about a point that is inside this kid. No, this this the entire ride is rotating about a point that is somewhere within this vertical section. That was a, that was a complicated case. This is a case uh, no. that we can have. We can have some hot. We can say this is the this is the case that is somewhat applicable for the case of Earth, where we have a spinning object going around in circles. Now, for that case, we can calculate moment for two different motions, considering them one at a time. Oh, sir, here, oh, that means you want to say that uh, even though a uh, even though a mass is uh, on the um, on the rod or whatever, but the pivot point is. Other than that mass, other than that area. Yes, it, the pivot point can be located outside the uh, outside the uh, outside the object. Yes, that's the point that I'm trying to highlight. Okay, now I get it. Sure. Yeah, Zara, uh, Zara, Bolo. Number book or race. Okay. So that's the part for the moment of uh, calculation for the moment of these forces. If you go forward. Asha. Then we have one more, uh, one more, uh, what can I say? One more shortcut to work with a lot of uh, paper two and paper one questions, and that shortcut is a pretty simple thing. Have a look. This statement reads: <laughs> For total moment to be zero, all the forces must pass through the same point. Take a look at look at this one. For total moment to be zero, all the forces must Pass through the same point. Now, what does it mean? Try to understand what what does it ex exactly mean. This means that if in any case where multiple forces are working on an object, the forces might have different values, different magnitude. They might work on a different different in different locations. That that wouldn't be a very big factor. For the actual orientation of the object, if you extend the force lines conveniently so that all of the force lines or the uh, uh, axis line of all the forces they can essentially uh, uh, cut uh, cut each other. For example, here you can see for a scenario. I mean, this is a very simple case where a uh, uh, horizontal bar, a uh, pivoted bar, is is hang from the wall using a piece of string. So let's say this is the this is a wall. This is a uh, this is a plank or a rod that is hinged to the wall over here, which was not drawn in this figure. And this is the weight of the of the bar. And uh, this is the string by which the bar is being being supported. So I actually showed two different weights over here, but I'm not uh, taking this into consideration because. You don't have to work with the combined in you know, a moment of inertia for two different objects. You don't have that, so you don't have to bother about this. Consider a single force. So the vertical force working downwards is this way. The tension of the string, which is pulling onto this end of the rod, is working in this way. So if I extend these two forces conveniently, conveniently in this case means that the tension force is working along this line. So and this is my weight that is given to my uh, to me in the question. Let's say, extending this force line downwards, I'm never gonna get a cross line, cross cross point. So to get to find out a cross point, I extend the line backwards and find found out this point. So now, what does point mean in this sentence? The same point. Intersection point of the two oh, of, of the two of the of the two uh, action lines of a force or more than two forces. 
Sure. So whenever we are pulling this uh, backwards, we get this intersection point, uh, and then this this information means that if these two forces altogether produces a zero resultant moment, so in that case, the third force or the fourth force or the fifth force, if you extend all of them if, uh, towards towards this position, all of these forces work the working line should also pass to this same point. The reason is pretty simple. The reason is this, is that if all the multiple forces, if all the multiple forces essentially pass through the same point, then if you calculate the moment of all of these forces about this point exactly, that I understand. This is the point where all the forces are aimed or getting away from. If this is the case, then the moment about this point should be how much? Zero. zero. And moment about this point should be zero. I mean, moment of, if you if you consider this point as your pivot point, moment. If I consider this one as my pivot point, in the case moment about about this point, by this force, or by this force, or by this force, by all of these three forces, the moment would be individually zero. Because in this case, the perpendicular distance of these forces from the from the pivot point is essentially zero. So you have the force available, that's good. But the force into perpendicular distance, that D would be zero for each of these forces. So individually, the moment produced by all of the forces would be zero. And as a result, the total moment produced by all the forces, all the forces would also be zero. This will prove that for this case, these forces will produce a zero resultant moment. Now, zero resultant moment is half the reason for an object to be in equilibrium. If we go, go a bit earlier, <clears throat> that for an object to be in equilibrium, we need to fulfill two reasons. What are those two reasons? Have a look. Conditions of equilibrium has, has two parts. The first part is that the resultant force has to be zero. And the same part is that resultant moment has to be zero. So resultant forces should be zero, can be checked using the triangle rule or the parallelogram rule or the polygon rule. Did I talk to you about the polygon rule yet? Did yes, I? sir. Yes. No, polygon, parallel. Parallelogram and triangle rules. Polygon rule, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, so the way we can check whether multiple forces do produce an equilibrium, we can check this out by using the uh, polygon uh, triangle rule or parallelogram rule or polygon rule uh, by doing this thing. Or we can also divide the forces into horizontal and vertical components and then do all the additions. So we can add up all the horizontal components to see whether the horizontal component is resultant horizontal component is zero or we can add up all the vertical components for all the forces and we can add those up to check whether that produce a perfect zero or not. So, conscious of equilibrium can be done mathematically, just a second. Conscious of equilibrium can be checked out by mathematically or by geographically, whereas conditions for resultant moment to be zero can be drawn out in a much simpler fashion. And that simpler process is you just extend the forces conveniently to have them cross at a, at a, at a certain point, the working line of the forces to work at, at, to converge or pass through a single point. If that happens, then you can say that the, that all of these forces will produce a zero moment irrespective of their forces values. So you can do that. I mean, one of the, reason, the, one of the simple way that I can actually further ex extrapolate this problem is that if you, if you consider a scenario, let's say if I draw the exact same thing, let's say actually, I'm gonna use black. Sir, action class is too just a good Sir, is your waiting list to nine. Sir, after yeah, you can walk to agent waiting list Sir, we both meeting to lock it. No, What? What? I locked the meeting? No. Oh, acha, my bad. Oops. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm actually meeting uh, enable waiting room. Put together, I'm lock meeting. Oops. Sorry, sorry. Ongita, Ongita, Koi. Sir, Boshes. Okay. 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 Sir,
অঙ্কিতা আই এম সো সরি আমি মিটিং এর ওয়েটিং রুম অন করতে গিয়ে মিটিং ভুলে লক করে দিয়েছিলাম দ্যাটস হোয়াই ইউ কুড নট গেট ইন মাই ব্যাড আচ্ছা ইটস ওকে স্যার থ্যাংক ইউ আচ্ছা থ্যাংকস থ্যাংকস টু দা দা কিডস অ্যাজ ওয়েল হু 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 অ্যাকচুয়ালি ইনফর্ম মি দ্যাট ইউ আর ওয়েটিং আউটসাইড থ্যাংক ইউ ওকে সো জো জন জন আপ ফ্রম নাও সো ইফ আই জাস্ট ড্র দা হোল থিং ওয়ান সেকেন্ড ওভার হিয়ার লেটস সে দিস ইজ দিস ইজ आवर ওয়াল দিস ইজ দা বার দ্যাট উই আর টকিং अबाउट and let's say we have a, a, a string that is supporting our cause over here so let's say for this example i'm not showing the cord or the string uh, exactly up to the end which is very much possible now if i try to show these forces over here we are going to have multiple forces working over here now let's say this is a non non uniform bar and if i if i if i tell you that the, the three forces which are working on this body the weight weight of the bar is working over here now you might wonder how does that even work what should work exactly at the center yes weight works at exactly at the center of a geometric object if it is an uniform object once you define an object to be non uniform the center the pivot point could be the the center of gravity could be anywhere for example we human beings are non uniform objects we don't have a specific geometric shape so we are bisymmetric which means that the center of gravity for our body would be somewhere along the line that if you think of a line that goes to your the center of your forehead to the tip of your nose to the middle of your lips to the middle of your chin to the uh, tip of your adam's apple if you have one and then through your to the center point of your body to the belly button and everything so if you think that is our, that is as our uh, as our uh, uh, symmetry line our we can essentially say for any human being because we are bisymmetric the cog would be located somewhere within that line but exactly where that we cannot specify because we are not like a rectangular or like a triangular or like a cuboid object we have different shapes so for non uniform bodies we can have the weight working at any point so let's say this is a non uniform bar i do, i do it to be a rectangle because that was easier for me to draw but i am just describing this this bar to be non uniform let's so let's say the weight is working over here this is a support string so the tension of this thing is always going to work over here so uh, there is no question there this is going to work over here now if i tell you that the reaction force that works at the pivot point i mean the pivot point the re, the, the pivot point always experience some reaction force a reaction force ke alochon me to par dekhabo don't worry the reaction force that this pivot point all experiences if i tell you that this reaction force is working in this manner and if i ask you to find out whether this two forces produce equilibrium or not uh you can very easily try go ahead and try and do that so the process is very simple try to find out the possible cross point of any of the two forces and see whether the third force go through that point so let's say i'm going to extend up this force so i'm going to do the additional drawing with blue let's say so i'm extending up this force over here this is the possible cross point of t and the reaction force let's say this is r so does the weight go through here if i go if i draw the weight it doesn't which means these two three forces would not produce equilibrium now if i just extrapolate this idea a little bit more and have a look what what i'm what i'm trying to do i might as well <clears throat> if i complete this triangle imaginary triangle okay now this figure is not essentially drawn to scale but what you can assume the w is over here so let's say this w force will be working somewhat along this the, along this line and this r is going to work along this line so i'm i'm just replacing the forces uh keeping their alignment intact which we can do for for a vector diagram so the weight will physically the weight will be working from this point the reaction force would be working from this point but if you are trying to draw a vector triangle vector triangle so i can essentially take this triangle out so i'm going to try and draw that triangle over here so i'm going to try and take out this triangle out over here so let's say i i draw this thing
So let's say this is a triangle that I'm going to draw. Within this triangle, this alignment should be responsible. Uh, uh, this alignment should be responsible for W. This element should be responsible for R. This element should be responsible for T. Now you can see if multiple forces have a situation like this, if they do not actually cross through each other, you can never have zero moment as a result of all of these forces. Just a second. Hello, Maslam. I'm class in So these three forces will definitely never produce a perfect zero moment. Let me tell you why. If you look at this physical scenario, you cannot choose one specific point about which the moment of all of these three forces can be zero. Let me give you some very easy choices, which would be easier for you to judge. Have a look. If you consider this as your imaginary pivot point to check for equilibrium, about this point, this force's moment would be zero, this force's moment would be zero. But how about this, this force? Would this W force produce zero moment about this point? That answer is no, because this is the perpendicular distance of W from this point. So you can very easily calculate a moment. So you will have some unbalanced moment. So we cannot say that the center object would be an at equilibrium of moment. That's one thing. Or if you consider that, if you want to consider this point as our possible pivot point, because like I said, that for the case of analysis, we can consider any point inside the object, outside the object as our pivot point. So let's say if you consider this point as, a, as our possible pivot point, for this point, this force, which is essentially going towards this point, and the W force, these two forces moment would be zero about this point. But how about the moment of T point? Would that be zero? The answer is no, because in that case, that moment can very well be uh, this much perpendicular distance. So we just rub certain portions of it. So this is the force T and this is the perpendicular distance. So you would not have zero moment produced by the force T. So forces moment produced by R would be zero, moment produced by W is zero, but moment produced by T for that point is not zero. So you will still have some unbalanced moment. So ultimately you cannot get zero moment for any random point, even if you choose any. We simply cannot choose one single pivot location in any if, if for a scenario like this, where the two forces do not cross each other, for which point or for which pivot point, the total moment produced by all of these forces would be exactly zero. Now you might wonder, well, why am I only choosing these points from the corner? What if I own, I chose these points exactly at the middle? So why, why, why don't I choose a point over here, uh, which would be the center of the inner circle of, the, of this triangle so that the perpendicular distances are all equal? Well, be my guest. If, I, if we do that, Let's say we choose a random point somewhere over here, so the perpendicular forces are always are all equal. What's going to happen in that scenario? Well, for if we choose a point from here for the for for or like this, we're going to have a perpendicular distance over here. Then we're going to have another perpendicular distance over here. Then we're going to have another perpendicular distance over here. Well, logically, we might be able to uh, we might be able to uh, get uh, get the result of moment zero if. At least one of these moments <coughs> used to be anti clockwise. Have a look. This is, if you consider this as a possible pivot point, I mean, consider the sir, moments, one, consider the moments one at a time. Yes. Sir, where are we at? Um, I can't keep track because my net is bad. Bujinai. So I'm a net bajishiva. I'm a sinteke bevarash. Where are we at? I'm not the Why are you saying this? Sir, I mean, I'm not put as I mean, this is I mean, made by the show to stir me. So, so give it some time, try to understand, other than me telling you personally where we are at, because we're in the middle of a lecture. Okay, that, that's the more smart thing to do, I believe. <coughs> more smart thing to do. So, I'm saying that you should be more smart than you are right now if you did that. Not that you are not smart, don't get the wrong idea. Yes. Okay, and so <clears throat> I mean, I, I, just just to kill some time uh, because I got interrupted anyway. Uh, whenever you say someone, "Oh, you look pretty today," this essentially means that other days you don't look pretty; you look ugly. Think, but if you say, "Oh, you look more, oh, you look prettier today," that essentially means other days you look pretty. Now you, you look prettier because that's essentially what you try to mean. You don't essentially want to mean unless you're unless you're really a really mean person that. That regularly you look ugly. So think about it. I mean, the choice of words can make a lot of difference if you come to think about it. Do you want right. us to be negative minded? 
I don't want you to be negative minded. I want you to be more careful with your words because the way current world works is that people have to pay by their life, by their money, by their fame, by their by their ownership stuffs to cover up for what, what comes out of their mouth. That's how the world works. So being alert about your words is not a downside for anyone's character. Could I be, could I make sense? Yeah, I don't want I, I don't want you to be negative minded. I want you to be careful that what could possibly be derived out of your statement. That's what I want you to think and choose your words that way. Choose your phrases and expressions that way. Be Jordan Peterson, for example. Okay, so if I consider this one, this point as our pivot point, let's say this this center as our pivot point. This R force, which I can conveniently let's say shift over here, this will produce a clockwise moment. This W force will also produce a clockwise moment. This T force about this point will also produce a clockwise moment. You see, all of these T forces are producing clockwise moment. If you add this up, should you get zero? That answer is a no. Because if you want to get a zero, then at least two of them might be working in the same direction. The other one has to be equal and opposite in the opposite, equal and opposite in the opposite direction so that you can essentially get a total result in zero out of them. If all the forces are producing same directional moment, the sum can only give you a much bigger resultant moment. So you cannot get a zero resultant moment out of this scenario as well. One of you, one of you kids actually raised hand. Anaf Islam, yes. Sir, we don't need to Islam. I think you got your question answered and you dropped your hand, which is, which perfectly makes sense. Did you understand the meaning of this whole part? That why is the why is this triangle uh, that I'm trying to explain to you? Or in other words, that why if the all the forces do have a common cross point, the moment they will produce a zero resultant moment. Is the idea clear to all of us? Yes. <laughs> The next part that we need to uh, see that what are the conditions for uh, Acha, this is actually a mathematical endeavor, but it's actually a pretty good conceptual challenge. So I'm going to talk about this thing pretty well. I'm, I'm going to redraw the whole figure for, because uh, 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 this will help me to uh, go through the process a bit more easily. Try to understand conditions for minimum force required for toppling or rolling over. Conditions for minimum force required for toppling or rolling over. So. What we are trying to show you over here, let me just cut this figure out and see if that works for us. No. What if we, I just, okay. <clears throat> let me elaborate this question for you and then I'm gonna uh, redraw it uh, as per requirement. Can everyone see what, what the letters over here clearly? Not clearly, but can you see, can you read them? Are they legible? Yes, sir. Okay. So let's say this is a rectangular piece that we're working with. It's a cuboid piece. It's, I intentionally make it, made it a bit taller so that we could label the height pretty easily. And let's say we want to topple the object over. We want to roll over the object to the right side. Now the first thing that I want you to understand, for this object to topple over or roll over, it has to use this base point as its pivot. So what we're trying to understand that if we apply some horizontal force from left to right onto this object, this object is not going to slide. That's the first thing that we are trying to establish over here. This object is not going to slide. The only thing that the object can do is going to roll over, which means the static friction is pretty high between this, between the base of the object and with the surface. The static friction is so high that you cannot make it slide. Rather, you will be more likely to roll over the object. It's going to fall over because this point uh, i mean this uh, uh, this base point of the uh, of the keyboard object is unable to move forward but it can work as a pivot point which basically is, is can be an outcome of a pretty large friction now if this is the pivot point then the object is going to roll over in a fashion in a certain fashion so what would be that fashion i mean so i'm going to take this thing in the paint 3d just to make mess with it Hold on, guys, have a look. I mean, Pin 3D can be pretty interesting to work with. Okay. 
to make sense that how if this object rolls how would this how would that rolling action work i'm i'm, I'm trying to select this whole thing with a very specific dimension amount in my head so i am choosing a rectangle so that the center of this rectangle this dot 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 line rectangle that you can see which i'm actually moving you can see i'm trying to select the rectangle in such a way so that this y point this one is at the middle of that rectangle so about this much the benefit that is now if i start to roll this figure this y point would be pretty much in the same position so have a look if the object rolls over this is how the rolling uh, rolling action would occur this is going to roll up like that and ultimately if it falls onto the ground it can fall up like that that's going to happen this y point would pretty much be in the y point i mean the ground is not going to rotate that's obvious uh, i i had to just to see a large part of the figure that's why i find that the ground is also rotating but that's not the case so this is how the rolling action would happen now what one of the other thing that i need to appreciate in this case the applied force was being the forward force was being applied horizontally at this location you can see that whenever we the object will start to rotate that application point which is the top tip of the object it has gone a bit higher compared to the initial initial level do you see that mm -hmm. if you consider the height of the height of the force application point when the object was in its original position then the force was being applied exactly at the top point now i'll tell you in a bit that why do we have to set the highest point uh, I'll tell you, but before that, I want you to appreciate this part. Which is what I'm trying to tell you. Have a have a look. In this case, the force was being applied at a h height above the ground, which is basically the most top level of the keyboard object. Now, if we rotate this thing, you can see that this corner, this this point, is rotating, uh, rotating about taking this one as your as your as your center. So, if you consider that this is actually a radius. Let's say if you could do, try to think this is actually radius, and this thing, this object rotates by, obviously it's gonna rise up, up till this much, up till this much means up till how much? As long as this point becomes exactly vertically above the center. So I'm I'm trying I'm to talk, trying to talk about what is the drawable thing over here. Mm. Sir, sorry to interrupt, sir. I had a question. Yeah, bolo, bolo. Sir, which line would be vertical? I mean, that's yeah, it. That's it. to find out what can I draw with. Oh, bye, sir. Oh, okay. <coughs> So let's say Okay, so let's say this is the uh, this is the actual uh, actual figure that I'm, uh, I'm going to work with. I, I have taken it out just to keep this reference intact so that I, I can uh, I can uh, crop out more sections out of it if if required. There's no way I can drag this thing. I mean, this is just crap. You just have to zoom in on by putting your mouse on that location and zoom it so that it it comes automatically at the center of your screen. That's just weird. Anyway, whatever. So let's say the ground line over here is this much. Let's say this is the ground line. So we have this ground line over here. And now we're going to start to make this object rotate. So what I'm trying to show you is that try to understand that try to imagine this diagonal line that goes through the object, which will essentially pass through the center of gravity, which I could not draw properly. So I can I draw a straight line. I think I can. Wow. Can I select color? No. Wow. So anyway, so try to consider this black line, which is the diagonal line. The reason I'm trying to show you this diagonal line is that when I'm gonna start pushing this object, and this object is gonna roll over, this line is gonna start to rotate, taking this point as your center, which means 
this line is gonna start rolling over along this track and eventually there will come a point when this line is gonna become vertical and this rectangular object would become diagonal do you get my point I'm gonna uh, do the rotation but do you understand what I'm saying yes yes someone is saying something in the chat window so I could change the color. So I'm not very good at this, uh, which I, but I plan to. Uh, I actually bought a, 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 a right pad, but I'm not using it anyway. I should be. <laughs> anyway, Dekho. Yeah, Zara, thank you. Uh, if you have questions, please raise hands. So this is going to happen, so which means that this application point that we did have over here, oh no, it, it does have uh, scroll bars. Wow. Acha. So what I'm trying to mean is that this, as we will, as we're going to rotate up, if we keep on applying the force at the same position of the object, we have to slowly raise our hand as we, as the object rolls from this orientation to the most diagonal orientation. So what I'm trying to mean is that this arrowhead of the object, this is gonna, this has to become uh, slightly different. Maybe it was a bad idea all, all, all over that I should have drawn it on. Okay, and then Boom. Did it work? No, it did not work because I am a very stupid person. Exactly. This is what I was trying to get at. So, and I'm going to fill up these spaces with. Uh, white, full white, 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 white. Okay, whatever. So try to understand what I'm trying to mean. <clears throat> the thing that I'm trying to mean that in the first case, we, let's say we are applying this force right over here. And this is the application point of the force. As the object is gonna start to rotate, we have to rotate, uh, we have to move our force application point along that track, let's say along that possible track of radius. And we and the, our hand has to go up up to here. Now this this position is not essentially essentially perfect because uh, I'll tell you why it's not perfect because this thing that I just did is not good enough. For one thing, that is this is not perfectly vertical. That should work. I hope it does work. No, it doesn't. Why? Now, 
Yes. We are good now. All right. So <clears throat> that's the point I'm trying to mean. So what, what is essentially happening here? If you try to imagine the uh, diagonal line, which I'm now trying to draw with a, with, with a purple line, this diagonal line practically travel from here to here. Do you understand this part? I was trying to get this much in your head. So the application point of the force, actually application point of the force, which was at this point, this application point of the force basically traveled along this circular arc. And now this has to be circular because obviously this diagonal length will be same as over here as well, as about this position. Now, we are trying to calculate how much will be the minimum force required to topple over the object. The word minimum is key. We want to try to calculate how much minimum force should be applied to topple over the object. Now, try to understand. Have a look if you if you go back and have a look at this figure. By default, if we want to topple over the object, we have to produce the moment, and more, we have to produce a moment that will be stronger slash bigger than the moment the object naturally has due to its weight. So let's say this is an uniform object and the weight of the object is working from its center of gravity, which is located at the, uh, at the geometric center of this rectangle, totally makes sense. And let's say this is W and when the rotation will happen, this is supposed to be a pivot point. So from the pivot point, this much distance is B by two. Now think about it, why B by two? What, what could this B by two mean? I mean, why divided by two? two? Exactly, base by two. Hold on, Kalkaro. If I consider the entire xy line as my base line, then the, the this much distance, the perpendicular distance, this would be half of the base line because I, I just told you earlier, slightly earlier, a bit earlier, that we considering this object as an uniform object. So this should be b by two. So about this point, the moment produced by this w force is w into b by two and it occurs moment, which comes over here. And it was moment w into b by two. If we want to lift up the object, or if we want to rotate the object, we have to apply a moment that should at least be equal with that, not smaller. Now you might wonder, well, if we apply an equal moment, it should still be in equilibrium. Why should it move? We want to roll it over. Well, that is true, but that actually has a bit something to do with kinematics and dynamics together. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll cover that slightly bigger requirement. Do you, do, do you understand what I'm saying? I mean, if I apply the exact amount of anti clockwise moment as this much, should this object start to rotate? Think about it. If we just balance it. The object should not rotate. There's a reason the object should not rotate. The reason is that you are just balancing out the moment that the object already has. You did not produce a bigger, uh, bigger opposite moment. If you just balanced it, the object is prepared to move, but you did not produce the impulse to make it move. Or if I give you a much simpler example, I mean, this is pretty important for you to understand. I don't think I have uh, ever talked about this in your regular classes. So I'm gonna try to use this idea. Let's say we have a surface over here and there's a rectangular object over here. Let's say I'm trying to, I mean, to make you sense of this idea, I'm, I'm giving you a different example. Let's say, this object is being pushed by a certain amount of force. Let's say the maximum frictional force that this surface that it can uh, this surface can exert onto this object to restrict the motion towards right. The maximum frictional force is let's say uh, let's say the maximum frictional force to, in this opposite direction is let's say 10.3 newton. Now I'm, I'm intentionally choosing a bhangti uh, amount like this. So let's say this is the maximum frictional force. So, so I'm gonna write this is a frictional force, frictional force small f max. This means one thing. If you apply a force that is smaller than 10.3, your frictional force would match that and the object would not move. It would be equilibrium. If you apply a force that is bigger than 10.3, your object is gonna start accelerate and the resultant force will be the subtraction of the, of the forward force minus the frictional force. That also works. What if you exert exactly 10.3 Newton force over here? If this force, forward force, has a value of exactly 10.3 Newton, now what should happen? Kids, try to appreciate this scenario in your, in your head. Resultant if you, force would be zero. Resultant force would become zero, true. But would the object start to move or would the object remain stationary? Yeah. It would remain stationary. It would remain stationary.
is there no one who is going to say the object is going to start moving sir it depends on the previous state of the object if the object was moving then it will be keep it will keep moving at the same velocity but if it was stationary it will keep stationary absolutely correct that's exactly what, what, what i was saying thank you very much for that response that now comes now now newton's first law actually comes into play that whenever you have equilibrium of forces how the object is going to behave is actually predetermined from its previous state now if this object if this situation did happen for a certain scenario where the object was earlier stationary then the object would remain stationary even at this case of equilibrium but what this essentially mean currently even a slight push at any direction would start the object's movement in the in that direction like let's say an a blind ant comes in from this part and bumps into this object and then the object is going to start moving you blow a little bit of air into this direction and then the object is going to start to rotate start to move forward because once you give it some velocity as with some slight bit of force and you still keep we keep keep these two forces equal to each other as long as you have the equilibrium available the object will maintain its velocity so this is the case so this is the scenario in 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 physics terms we use you say this is the scenario that we say to be critical equilibrium or marginal equilibrium critical equilibrium means that the object is on the verge of moving but didn't start to move yet anything more slightly more like uh like infinitesimally infinite infinitesimally small more would start the object to move do you get the point i had a question yes sir suppose this is a three dimensional space and the friction is moving towards the negative x axis and we are giving the force in the positive x axis and the direct resultant force is zero what if a force comes from the z axis will it move well if you want if you want if you if you if you want to consider uh, along the z axis i mean by z axis do you mean the vertical axis or 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 through the page through the page through the page beautiful so to consider whether the object is going to move in the z axis you have to once again consider the object is experiencing a frictional force because of the contact of the base on the surface towards left so the base is basically touching the uh, surface on which it is located and that space is capable of producing a 10.3 newton maximum frictional force opposing the uh, physical force applied now if we have that much force on the native uh, along the x axis along the z axis the friction force should not be zero right logically speaking it might as well be zero for example or for i mean it it might be zero with appropriate design but logically speaking if you consider a basic surface on which a normal object is placed along the z axis the friction force should not be zero so that's why uh, what i should respond to your question is that by applying a, even a small amount of force along the z axis the object should not start to moving we have to once again give a force that is somewhat bigger than the friction force available along the z axis these two forces uh, these two friction forces doesn't have to be equal uh it doesn't have to be equal but you have to overcome the frictional force maximum friction force if you want to start moving that's my response we are say yes sir acha one of the cases uh, because it's relevant for this scenario is that one of i mean uh, one of the cases where we you can think about that why the object would have different frictions in different cases because you might have i mean in this case you might have rails under the object this might not might not be a perfectly flat surface you might have one directional wheel not revolving wheel one directional wheel under this object or one directional wheel as guide system onto the surface so the axis of the i mean the the wheel orientation will definitely give you a much lower friction compared to any other direction because the wheels will allow the motion or it will it will it will uh, what it will help the motion or to reduce friction so you can have different amount of friction in different direction that is dependent on your uh, on your surface design and the object interaction that's the idea of geometric pattern or geometric design design consideration but for a simplified version that where the object is basically sitting on a normal surface uh, you will have to overcome the friction along any direction to start movement in that direction that's the simple bottom line do it make sense anyone yes, sir 
Okay. So, uh, so what I'm trying to mean is that, uh, achha, did we understand the idea of critical equilibrium altogether? I'm going to give you another example for critical equilibrium because this is important. We, we're going to have to work with that after a while. But a example to go second that this is the situation that we are defining to be critical equilibrium or marginal equilibrium. Do we understand this part clearly, everyone? Yes, sir. So, watch this question, give me some notion. Right in the chat window, yes or just why is good. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do you kids, any of you know, before I just take, go ahead and, and discuss the next part, I just had one question pop in my head. There's this another kid who wanted to start our classes today, but I could not, I forgot to complete my communication with him, who is, which is this guy. Where is this kid? Hi, hi. On, just a second. I'm, just, I'm not killing time. I'm really trying to find out someone and would like to ask you kids a question. What? Hey, do you guys know this gate? I and I, I and everything. Anyone? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Which school is? Yes, master. Oh, okay, okay. I was, I was missing, I was missing with him. This is what happened. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's not me. I'm not going to Yep, yep. It's true. It's true. I mean, if you want to achieve something, it's John Wick, or at least partially John Wick. Sure will. <laughs> That's a very, very functional ice-breaking session, to be honest. I mean, kids get to know that what I'm like. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not afraid of anything. 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 I'm not afraid of <laughs> so yeah, we are here. And I wanted to give you another example of terminal equilibrium or limiting equilibrium. So this is a pretty interesting example. Try to understand. Let me draw something and you can start to guess what this thing is. That's me, big belly. <laughs> so, what is this? Your house. A lift. Exactly, it's an elevator. Now think about it. Consider the scenario, try to visualize. A lift is currently located at the ground floor of the building. I entered the lift. I press the button two. Let's I want to go to level two, for whatever reason. Uh, so, uh, what is gonna happen immediately after? The lift is going to start going upwards, but would it accelerate 
all the distance going from level zero to uh, level one to level two? No. no. It will start the upward motion and accelerate for even so small of a time to get the lift a small upward velocity, maybe let's say two kilometers per hour or maybe three kilometers per hour, five kilometers per hour, pretty small distance, or maybe let's say half meter per second. A speed that we are comfortable in the sense that the acceleration that we will require to achieve that upward velocity would be, we would not be uncomfortable with that acceleration because whenever we will have that additional acceleration, we would experience our weight to become increased because we have to accelerate up. I mean, our, my body can be only accelerated upwards by exerting a bigger force on my feet in the upward direction. So I need to have an upward force. Let's say I'm going to show this by blue. Uh, uh, I need to have an upward force on my feet, even for, even for a small duration of time, to make my body going upwards at, let's say, one meter per second speed. So to give my body, along with the lift box itself, uh, that much upward velocity, I have to have a slightly larger upward force than my weight. So that upward force has to come from the reaction force of the, of the base of the lift that I'm standing on, or from the floor of the lift. So that additional force would work on me for a very small amount of time. And this would set me and the lift box into motion. Once we reach that one meter per second speed, then the lift will not accelerate any further because we're not going to go through an indefinite period of acceleration. We're going to get a small acceleration and immediately the lift is going to start to move upwards in a constant velocity, at a constant velocity. And it's going to cover the rest of the distance at that constant velocity till it reaches the very last end, till it reaches the very last end of its motion. So if I try to draw, the velocity time graph, uh, should I keep this out over here? I don't think so. If I try to draw the velocity time graph for this scenario, I mean, I am showing you this part, this, this information because this is important for your understanding. So you, it will be helpful for us in the long run or it might pop up in any random time. So yeah, I might as well describe this right now. No big deal. If you have questions, raise your hand. No big deal. But just don't pop questions dead directly. So if I draw the velocity time graph, let's say over here, the way I can draw the velocity time graph, let's say I, this is my velocity time graph. I am starting the time count at the instant I'm entering into the lift. So I'm entering the lift. Still, my lift is not moving. So my velocity, my vertical velocity is zero, 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 zero. I press the switch. The lift door closes. Now the motor starts to work. For a small duration, there would be an acceleration. And once I reach that velocity, then the velocity becomes constant. It will remain at that point till I reach my destination. Just before I reach my exact height, the lift mechanism, these wires are gonna work by the motor to decelerate me back to zero so that I, I, my, so that my lift comes to stop at level three. So this is where the acceleration is starting. So this is exactly where the motion is starting. This is where the motion is stopping. For the significant part of this journey, the lift will be moving at a constant upward velocity so that we are not uncomfortable with it so that we still sense our regular weight as the lift is moving. So we have a sense of safety and everything. But to make it to go into motion, it would have to accelerate for a small duration. And then at the end of the journey, close, close to the end of the journey, to make it stop, it has to apply a slightly downward resultant force. Now, if you want a downward resultant force, well, one thing is true. Uh, if I give you some number, let's say if I give you some number, let's say my weight in this, in this lift is 100 Newton. So let's say I only have a mass of 10 kg, hypothetical values. Uh, figure not drawn to scale, numbers are not. Let's say I have a weight of 100 Newton. So if the lift was stationary, or if the lift is going in at a constant upward velocity, which also means equilibrium of force. I mean, being stationary means equilibrium of force zero, being constant velocity also means uh, equi equilibrium, equilibrium situation. So the resultant force is zero. For both of these cases, the upward force has to be 100 Newton as well. But when, I, when I'm trying to get an acceleration, when the lift is going upwards, my upward force should be slightly bigger than uh, 100 Newton. So let's say for this duration, the uniform force that was having upwards, let's say this upward force, let me show you by, let's say blue, sky blue. So, it, so let's say for this duration, the force was 102 Newton. So I'm gonna have on my feet, slightly bigger force than I'm used to. For my weight, I'm used to experiencing 102 Newton force 
on my feet at the bottom of my feet what is what is that surface called i mean for hand it's called the palm what is what, what is the name of the bottom of the feet it doesn't have it does it have any name soul bottom of the field is called the soul okay beautiful new word okay come again so let's say uh, I am used to to experience 100 Newton of upward force because of my weight whenever I'm moving around in a normal case. So that is my regular sensation of weight. So, but if I'm accelerating, this floor should exert a higher force on, uh, on me in the upward direction than my weight so that I have a 2 Newton resultant force which should be working on me for this amount of time, let's say this amount of time, and I'll have this upward velocity, whatever that value is. Maybe let's say one meter per second, just to uh, give you an idea. One meter per second is actually pretty high speed for a lift, not usual, usual, but let's assume it. So I would experience a bit bigger force, but that would not last for a long time. This will be very small duration. Then the lift is gonna start, then the lift is gonna reduce that force back to 100 Newton one second. So it will exist for a small duration, Immediately after that, this force is going to become once again 100 Newton. And for this duration of journey, I would be experiencing equal force of my weight. So that I'm, I'm moving upwards at a constant velocity. Right before the lift is about to decelerate to stop, you have to understand one thing very carefully. Please remember this. This is my weight. This number cannot be changed. What can change is my upward force by the effect, effect of these cables, how these cables are going to exert force onto the lift box which ultimately exert the force on my feet in the upward direction because of the construction. So when uh, close, to the, uh, uh, close to the end point of the channel, let's say up over here, the lift is gonna reduce the upward force. Let's say in that case, if I draw this with a green arrow, the lift is gonna give my feet a force of let's say 98 Newton. So now it's gonna give me an upward force that is somewhat smaller than my weight. As a result, I'm gonna have a resultant force of how much? For this duration, what would be the resultant force? Respond. Minus two. <laughs> minus two. Uh, uh, minus two. Minus two because it would be the magnitude would be two, but that duration would be working downwards. So because my velocity was upwards, and for this duration the x, the force is gonna work downwards, so I'm gonna decelerate and eventually come to a stop at my uh, desired destination of the lift. So that's basically how the whole lift works in all of his cases. So the lift cable operate so that they can change the upward force that I get from the base of the lift on my body. The lift does not operate to change my weight because my weight doesn't change. The opposite thing can also happen if you are, if you start, if you, if you, if you start from a higher level and if you start to go downwards. Acha, before I get into that part of the discussion, any of you, did you understand this discussion properly? Do you have any question? Anyone? Sir, can you explain the deceleration part again? <clears throat> yeah, I, I'll explain the deceleration part again. Okay. The idea is for the acceleration, the upward force has to be bigger than the downward force. So for the, I mean, I'm taking a bit of reference from here. I'm going to get over here. So when the, when, when the lift wanted me to accelerate along the lift, lift box as well, it had to give me a force that is slightly bigger than my weight. So let's say then the force was 102 Newton. When I have to decelerate, my resultant, has to, resultant force has to work downwards. Now I have a built-in force working downwards, which is my weight. So all that it has to do is to reduce the upward force so that I have a resultant force working downwards. So in that case, the upward force becomes less than 100 Newton. So the resultant can be working downwards and I'll decelerate over the duration. Thank you, sir. Good. Asha, graph ta kink hoar actually reason hoar kotha na. I mean, if you draw a practical graph, this graph should actually actually, actually be smoothed out. Uh, this, graph, this graph should have smoothed out. I, I have drawn with kink and not to confuse you. For a, practical, for, for a practical scenario, this graph would have a smooth curves over here because I mean, the lift usually doesn't work in a way that we actually uh, get a sensation of sudden velocity or a change. I mean, uh, so, uh, so this is the velocity versus time graph, but if I actually try to draw the 
force graph or if I try to draw the resultant force graph, I should not draw it over there. Let's say I try to draw in the same uh, alignment. That might as well be a, that might be a good idea. Please <laughs> question please. So if I take it over here, let's say if I try to draw in another axis, the resultant force over here. So this I'm on a graph Pura ta abar. Yes, sir. Acha, question ta bolo. Mane which part? Acha, if that's the problem, then I prefer not to discuss it and take everyone's time. Uh, I'll upload the lecture in a bit. Uh, you see the lecture and you ask me questions personally. Oh, okay, sir. Okay, I'll help you. No big deal. <laughs> if I try to draw the uh, resultant force over here, resultant force over time over here, the way this could work, I mean. For all the parts, you have you have horizontal uh, line or you have uh, zero gradient. Your resultant force will also will also be zero. So if I try to draw this with red, so up over here, resultant force zero 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 zero. When the lift is tend to go upwards, I'll have a resultant force in the upward direction. So there would be, uh, I mean, for this much duration, if I try to draw some reference line to give you some context. So for this much duration, I'd have some upward force. Now, because I have told you already that this upward force is going to be a fixed to Newton, it's not going to be a gradual force. I might as well draw my graph to be an upward, a solid going upwards, then a flat line, and then going downwards. Well, the tip of this line happens to be two. If I want to give you a bit more idea, this, this should be plus two. And let's say the unit of this thing is Newton. So you will have two Newton force working on me for this duration of the acceleration. Then once again, this this acceleration would become zero all the way up to the entire journey that I'm going upwards for the longer period of the journey and then up over at this point and up over up to to this point <coughs> at this point the force is gonna start working downwards because I want to decelerate so to achieve that <coughs> this is gonna I'm gonna have a force exactly in the opposite direction because this force is force forces working in the upward direction this is another force is working in the downward direction so you cannot show these two forces on the same graph you cannot uh, being vector quantity, their values are uh, values should be plus and minus, and in the vectors in the vector in the graph they should exist on exist on the opposite sides of the x-axis. So this one might as well be shown as minus two four minus two newton, and this might eventually come to zero over here, and eventually I am stopped over here. So if I try to represent this number, I mean this reference value is on this axis is minus two. So a graph to butchuk na dekho. Uh, decelerate uh, decelerate the upward velocity has to be decelerated which means you have to reduce the upward velocity if you want to reduce the upward velocity you need a resultant acceleration downwards or resultant force downwards uh, that actually is governed by the wheels and the copicals that i mean that this this is the I have only drawn the lift body and the cable. A cable uh, these cables are not disconnected. They actually go all the way up to the uh, top of the lift uh, lift chamber of the building or the structure. And we have some gears, mechanisms, and wheels and and copicals to lift up the whole whole thing. So we take help from those mechanism and provide the acceleration for a small duration or provide the distance for a small duration, which is governed by the circuit of the lift mechanism. Uh, that's that's what uh, that's what the whole the whole electronics part is important that you press the switch of a level it senses that switch is being pressed and the doors get closed then it's using some sensor it senses that both of the doors are closed both of the doors means uh, for any level there are two doors the lift door and also the level door both of the doors are closed so then it starts to more start the motor maintains the acceleration for a small duration of time then stops that acceleration and maintains uniform speed so it all works on with the algorithm that we put in Sir. Butcho. Sir. Yes. Yes. Bolo. Zara bolo. Sir, two Oh, I assume this number two. I, I was trying Asha. to show you that I was I was trying to show you that I am not going to produce an uncomfortable acceleration on my body. <clears throat> so I am used to 100 newton of force on my feet as a reaction force of my weight. So I'm going to give me uh, give I, I I I want the lift to give me. Uh, accelerating force that is not too large compared to that force for example let's say if i wanted to gain a really high speed let's say if i give you a simple example let's say you are trying to reach the top floor of burj al khalifa the tallest building in the world now it would not be a good idea 
to start with a regular leaf like we have in our country for most of our household purposes from zero, level zero to reach up to the higher top level. I mean, this is going to take two, three hours to you for you to exist in the, uh, in the lift. That's not practical. So what, what, this, what these tall buildings have is that they have some express elevators, which is going to take you without any stop, like an express train from, let's say, from level zero to level 100. And these lifts are designed to work with extremely high acceleration and extremely high deceleration. And that journey can be pretty short. But this lift will not money. Let's say there's a person who has, who has rented an office at the 150th floor in Burj Al Khalifa. And that person has to go there every day. So what he can do, he, can, he is going to get into the lift of the express elevator at the ground floor. He's going to press 100. And the lift can take from 0 to 100 in less than 30 seconds. Which means in that case, the acceleration is going to be much too higher. It would be, it would not be physiologically distressing, but you'd be able to sense that. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if any of you have experienced this in your life. I have that whenever the leaf starts to go up pretty fast or whenever the leaf starts to decelerate pretty fast, sometimes you might feel some pressure variation in your ears. Have any of you sensed it? When you yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Well, being comfortable with this acceleration means you shouldn't be able to detect that. For example, if this force, uh, this force, I mean, I'm, I'm using, I'm, for this example, I'm using the idea that my, uh, my force, there's a lot of force that I'm trying to govern my uh, speed is two Newton, only two Newton, which is only 2% of the, of my regular experience weight, which totally makes sense. But if this resonant force was less than 50 Newton, let's say that the, let's say this upward force for the acceleration is supposed to be 150 and the upward force for the deceleration is supposed to be 50 only. So if the resonant force was 50% compared to my regular experience force, I would have definitely sensed that pressure variation on my feet and also in my ears. Now, I mean, the way ears work is that it senses a rapid change of, uh, a rapid change of uh, the movement of the uh, powdered stuffs, which are inside the uh, nervous system of the ear, in, in our internal ear, and it senses that pressure variation and tells your brain that you are, un you are undergoing some uh, severe situation change. That situation change being that you are being accelerated. So you have some, I mean, your, your, your nervous system alerts you that something is happening. Be cautious or something like that. So, a part of it, Bujhaga Sir, Palaman? Yes, sir. If I want to draw, the acceleration versus time graph from this force versus time graph, how would that graph look like? If I want to draw that, how would that look like? I'm gonna zoom out a little bit so that you can see the whole figure. I think that, that is a bit small. So just like the force graph, Shape wise, how about values? How about values? So it depends on the mass, right? So yeah, what is the mass of this of my body? It's zero point two. 0 0.2 is a correct response. Pull on, Dako. Question and Kotama mass bully name, but I did give you my weight, right? Yes. Well, you can divide it by, let's say, approximately 10. Let's say we are considering it to be 10, but although it's not supposed to be 10, it's supposed to be 9.8 or 9.81. But consider as you mean it to be 10 because it's not a very, uh, I'm trying to discuss that term. So, Let's consider the simpler version of gravitational acceleration. So easier calculation. So I, I might as well say that if I consider G is approximately, I'm using the sign approximately 10 meter per second squared, that's the scenario. Then this 100 Newton of force would also mean that my mass is exactly 10 kg, right? So if my mass is 10 kg, then the acceleration should be resultant force divided by mass. So the acceleration value would be identical as this graph. So other than drawing this whole graph, what I can do and what I intend to do is that I can copy paste this graph. So let's say I'm gonna copy paste this graph all together. Except for I'm gonna do one change. What is that change? 
I'm going to label these values. So acceleration unit which is meter per cent square. The unit should be showing up on the axis as slash meter per cent square. This level should be 0 0.2. 0 0.2. And this level should be? Negative 0 0.2. Negative 0 0.2. That's why I'm going to स्मूथ कार so i'm not i didn't show you the curve scenario because that would be difficult for me to explain and 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 evaluate in terms of normal calculation but practical scenario in practical scenarios this force does not change such rapidly that suddenly there is a force and suddenly that the force goes out the force increases gradually and it reaches a peak value and it decreases gradually as it comes to stop so this this entire i mean for a typical typical lift the duration of this whole thing might as well be less than 10 2 seconds you might only accelerate for two seconds only, and you have the enough required speed to start your journey upwards or downwards, and vice versa. So one of the things that I would like to tell you that this was the example for when when the lift was in the ground floor and we are trying to go into the upper floor. What if the scenario is different? What if the scenario is exactly opposite? That you are let's say located at the tenth floor of the building and you want to go to level level one. So left from level ten to level one, you have to go downwards. How should the forces change in that scenario for the same person for me? Hundred newton weight. How would that change? This, I mean, the, for this discussion was altogether what going upwards. If you're trying to go downwards, in that case, how would this graph look like with respect to this axis system? Sir, image of mirror uh, reflection with x axis is the mirror line. That's absolutely correct. And how about for the values? Acha, to my dear classmate, answer goes. He is correct, but I need all of all the rest of you to think. If the lift is currently located at that at level ten and it is about to go down, you need to achieve some downward velocity. Think about it. Is it correct? Lift is located at level ten. You are trying to go down, so you need to get some downward velocity. Downward velocity should come from a downward resultant acceleration, resultant force. You have a built-in downward force. What is the name of this force? Weight. Weight. So you could not change that. What is the only force that you can change? Upward force. Upward, Upward force, force, which is the reaction force from the floor of the lift. Which means, if you are trying to start your journey in the downward direction, first, what does the what the lift does is that it reduces that tension, and that force becomes smaller than your weight. As a result, you have a downward force. They say. In that case, so in the going down downwards, this will happen first. This will happen at the last. So you're gonna first accelerate. I mean, speed up in the downward direction, and then you will have the uniform velocity journey, and then you will have deceleration to slow down to zero or stop. So if I consider this whole thing, I mean, in this case, I mean, the way this graph was being done is that we considered upward direction as positive, right? Because this is zero velocity, this is positive velocity. Positive velocity was considered as upward velocity. So if we try to draw this whole graph, entire graph, uh, uh, with respect to uh, for going downwards, we might as well have this all of these things flipped with respect to x-axis, which means it is possible that for Let me copy this whole uh, whole whole thing up. I might regret this. But let's try this, for example. Copy my name. Copy my name. Okay, so what is going to happen for the downward velocity? Let's zoom in on. This will be just flipped horizontally because now we are going downwards. So this part of the graph, I use like non-translation. So this graph is going to look like this. Oh. 
Oops. Exactly. This is how the, this graph is going to look like. And same thing for here. And same thing from for here as well. Hold on. That's all. Considering upward as positive, this is the change that we're going to come across. Sir, what is your graph? Kunta? Second graph. Second graph. Second graph. Second graph. Sure. Okay. In this case, we considered upward vectors as positive vectors. So, so when we are starting to go upwards in the first example, the initially to get an upward velocity, we had to get an upward resultant force. That's why the initial thing that happened was 102 Newton. So this is the upward resultant force over here. Positive force. Because upward is considered positive. But when we try to come down from level 10 to level zero, the initial force should be working downwards. Resultant force that is. So your weight will be same, but your reaction force should become 98 Newton, let's say. As a result, your initial force, as you start to go downwards, that should be working down or downwards because I have considered upward vectors as positive. So that downward force is labeled on the negative y axis. That's why the first force is minus two. And then we have plus two over here. Yes, sir, plus two, the can oh, because, uh, because whenever the object is trying to this, I mean, the, I mean, try to understand it. as the lift is going downwards, it has a downward velocity. Which is negative, well and good. Now we want to stop. We want to convert this velocity to zero, which means you have to slow it down. So the acceleration should work in the upward direction, right? If you want to stop a downward falling object, your acceleration should be opposite to that velocity. So up, so the acceleration should be upwards, which means the resultant force should be upwards as well. So. Which is. Which is. Yes, sir. Okay. So yeah, that was another part. Uh, I actually moved to the idea of lift because I, I, I actually moved here, drifted here from the idea of the equilibrium case uh, or, or limiting equilibrium. This is actually a good understanding for you. Uh, these are not exclusively relevant to theoretical discussion, but these are uh, part of the mathematical part. So it's not essentially, I mean, this discussion that I just did over here, does not exclusively belong to this chapter. This idea might be useful for other chapters as well. But since it's popped up over here, so we went through the example. So if I just go back to my original point, what I was trying to say is that currently for this object to topple over, the built-in moment that this object already has with respect to this point is W into B by two, which is an anti-clockwise direction. To make the rotation getting started, the minimum moment we have to produce is to balance it out. So that's why we have given equals to. So we're trying to calculate the critical equilibrium scenario. Then what is the minimum moment that we require to do? So if we apply the force, if we apply some force and get a clockwise moment to provide, to get the smallest force, a minimum force, the perpendicular distance has to be biggest because force is given by what? Force into, so a moment is given by force into perpendicular distance. If your total value has to be equal to W by two. So money, it may, what I'm trying to mean that the clockwise moment produced by the applied force should be equal to this much. So you can either achieve this by a big F, small H, or you could achieve this by a big H, small F. We are trying to find out what is the scenario for smallest a, F. If you want to have the, have the smallest F, you have to have the biggest H. That's why this force was exerted on the very top level. I mean, if you, if you just, just for the sake of discussion, if you apply a force uh, at, at this level, what would be my perpendicular distance? This would be my perpendicular distance, right? But once again, to be able to topple this over, the product of this force and this perpendicular distance should be equal to this one. Which means since your perpendicular distance is smaller compared to the red line, the force has to become bigger. Or if I try to give you some numbers, let's say, if it is possible to topple over this object by applying a force of five Newton over here, this force might as well be six Newton. The further you will go down, you'll have to exert bigger and bigger force because whatever you are losing in terms of H, you should be gaining in terms of F. <clears throat> Do I make sense? Yes, sir. Hmm? So, uh, sure. 
if we want to get the moment to overcome the uh, if we want to get the moment to overcome the moment due to the weight please respond if you do if you have question please do respond it's perfectly all right to respond in the class and you are here to learn so there is no harm there is no nothing to lose if you just express that so repeat one more time or just i couldn't get it it's perfectly all right that's why you are here for so uh, if we want to get this anti clockwise moment balanced out by the application of this force clockwise moment we want to get the minimum force so the force can be obtained by the product of four f into h listen this number has to be something so you can get this same thing same value either by having a large value of f and a small value of h or vice versa if you want to have the smallest value of f to be working for us then the, then your h has to be the biggest so let's say if we apply the force exactly on the topmost level let's say in this case by applying a force of 5 newton maybe we'll be able to topple this over but what if we apply the force a bit below this level if this h is somewhat smaller than this h let's say i'm going to give it h prime if this h prime is somewhat smaller because now you're having a smaller height but ultimately your total moment has to be equal to this much which means your force has to be bigger so whatever you are losing in terms of h you have to gain in terms of force so that the product of these two things is essentially equal to w into b by 2 that's the point that i'm trying to make bujhe yes, sir g yes, sir acha <coughs> so this sir, is sir i have a class at 3 pm so sir you can, can leave it as quickly as possible i might let's have a look so this is the this is the scenario so to get the minimum force we have to apply the force at the very top level of the uh, of the object so that we can roll over the object with the minimum application of force so that's where this equation comes in w b by 2 equals to f into h so if we can have this then it's going to roll over let's have a look at this two paragraph and we might as well call it a day this is about time uh have a look if this keyboard rolls over either x or y will be the pivot point now we have said x or y because the question doesn't say in which direction we are toppling over uh, so for the discussion the y would be the pivot point because you are applying force from the uh, left so this would be your pivot point if we apply force from this direction x would as well be your pivot point and the anti clockwise moment produced by w about y is w into b by 2 to roll it over to the right side you have to match this moment in clockwise direction so i use this word have a look i didn't say bigger i use the word match this moment uh in clockwise direction to have this done with the least force applied applied force must be the furthest away vertically from y and horizontal who in which case cm is fh clockwise moment is force into height for minimum force cases we deal with terminal or critical equilibrium this means acm equals to cm to start the ruling process initially we will need a slightly bigger cm than acm but for the duration of rolling acm equals to cm is enough so basically what i discussed to to you about the idea of forces over here for velocity and and acceleration is equally applicable for the case of rotation as well which means if you apply that exact amount of moment of fh that is exactly equal to this one this object is not going to start to roll but if someone comes over here and blow their blow a bit of air then the object can start its roll and it's going to maintain its rolling even when you have equilibrium i mean the idea of 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 newton's first law for forces is equally applicable for rotational cases as well if you have rotational equilibrium object will try to maintain its rotational scenario if it is stationary it will remain stationary if it is if it was spinning or rotating it is going to keep maintain that rotation so to start the rotation maybe your uh, your clockwise moment should be slightly ever so slightly bigger than the anti clockwise moment and once you start the rotation you can basically have them equal once again and important part for you to understand i mean the reason i actually bothered your head with this much information is this try to understand whenever we are applying a force let's say i'm going to choose one draw one horizontal arrow over here and i'm going to copy paste this one because i i want to tell you what the force this has to be so let's say this this is the force that i'm trying to draw when i'm when i'll apply this force right over here let's say my perpendicular distance is from this force to the ground this is my h as the object starts to roll this force is going to get higher away from the ground am i correct height ta bere jacche na vertical height yes, that <laughs> which yes, means sir. logically speaking if you want to produce that exact amount of moment edike height ta bartese eta hocche ekta subidha ar ekta subidha hocche 
डायगोनलिंगजेक्ट की ठीक <coughs> So you are having this b by two, this b by two thing that is also going to slowly go, go become less because the weight is slowly moving to the right. So we are having two factors in play. As the object keeps on rolling, the perpendicular height of the applied force that is increasing. This one is going higher, bigger, and this one is becoming smaller. Which means together your required clockwise moment will essentially become smaller and smaller which means the amount of force that you will have to apply onto this object exactly at this level at at this level as we are going to slowly go forward you would have to apply less and less and less force do you understand my point yes okay and you, the object is going to basically roll over once you <coughs> push the object past this position because at beyond this point the weight of the object would start to work on the right side of this y point and the weight is definitely going to pull this over so all that you have to do to make the object roll over to the other side is to rotate it or or just make it move from this orientation to this orientation a orientation to a orientation move korte parle baki duko automatically weight er jonno amader hoye jabe amader far niche theke further push diye kaaj ta kora lagbe na sir what will happen if the weight is exactly on top of y uh this is uh, the, at that scenario we, the the moment on the object should be zero i mean moment available from the i mean this at this case uh you can it keep be the balanced system. yeah it will be balanced yeah 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 ei porjonto bujha geche shobar bolo ban ঠিক আছে উইল পিক ইট পিক আপ দা লেকচার ফ্রম দিস পয়েন্ট অনওয়ার্ডস ইন দা নেক্সট ক্লাস ডিড আই গিভ ইউ দা উইল কিউ গিভ ওয়ার্কশিটস অফ দিস চ্যাপ্টার ইন ইওর মেসেঞ্জার মেসেঞ্জার চ্যাট না স্যার আচ্ছা ঠিক আছে আমি তাহলে আজকে আপলোড করে দিব যেগুলো আমরা আলাপ করতে তোমার চাইলে কেউ যদি সময় করতে পারে ফর ইন্টারেস্টেড ইন্টারেস্টেড ইউ ক্যান ট্রাই দিস আউট বাট উই আর গোনা কভার আ স্মল বিট অফ এডিশনাল ডিসকাশন ইন দা নেক্সট ক্লাস এন্ড উইল স্টার্ট ডিসকাসিং সাম প্রবলেম ফ্রম দা ওয়ার্কশিট আই এম নট গিভিং এনি হোমওয়ার্ক I'll choose up some random problems, uh, important problems that I personally feel to be discussed in the class before you just dive into the worksheet on your own. And then uh, after next class, I'll uh, uh, the homework session will start. Yes, follow. Uh, balance of again, we point in. Oh, by by you saying the word balance, I'm not saying balance of moment. What what I'm trying to mean is that at this point, the moment produced by the weight would become zero. Yeah. Which means that you can essentially keep this object in this orientation indefinitely. Provided nothing else disturbs it, right? If you don't apply any force. Yeah, if you don't have apply any force, if we can make sure that no force would be applied, we might be able to actually make the object stand on this corner indefinitely. Right. Yeah. All right, kids. Thank you very much for uh, everyone. Thanks for the additional five minutes of attention. Uh, we'll pick up pick up from this point next class. If you have any question about this whole lecture, the lecture will be uploaded pretty pretty soon. If you have any question about the whole discussion about the lift or anything else, you can I can ask people personally in the messenger or you can also comment on the YouTube video. Whatever works for you. All right, Sam. Thank you very much. Bye.